Well, hi, everyone, and welcome back to Pushing the Limits. Today, I have one of my very dear friends, Kim Morrison, back on the show. Kim, welcome to Pushing oh, the Limits again. Such a treat to be with you, my friend. Uh, we've just been rabbiting. We, we couldn't stop talking to actually get the recording done because we just got so much to like. Uh, la, 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 la. <laughs> we almost should have recorded what we just pre did. <laughs> <laughs> All the cool people we've got to meet. I've got to introduce you to this person. And this person. Exactly. Uh, so yeah, we, we love swapping and collaborating and doing lots of crazy things. So Kim, for those of you who don't know you, and most people should because you're world famous uh, and uh, you're an author of six books, you're a mum, uh, you're a, you have your own amazing company, but tell us a little bit about Kim Morrison. Who's Kim Morrison? Where are you sitting at the moment? <laughs> On the Sunshine Coast. World famous in Watala is what I say. Um, <laughs> I'm here on the Sunshine Coast, obviously a Kiwi, grew up in New Zealand, married Danny Morrison, the former New Zealand cricketer, fast paced bowler. And, you know, we had an inc incredible life. And then our world got turned upside down when sadly we lost his sister to suicide. And we then Danny went through his whole own world of emotions. And as you can imagine, being a top international athlete yep. to now a father of two, a mortgage, losing a sister, and then we lost our house, and then we lost a whole lot of money that we'd invested. All of a sudden, I think Danny started to question who the frick he was. Yeah. And to watch that as a wife, a partner, and someone that you love Put, kept pushing me further down the rabbit hole and understanding what makes us tick. Why do people struggle? Why do people go through tough times? What is the meaning of it? So that took me on a journey after writing a number of books around essential oils, my passion with plants and aromatherapy and our connection to nature. Um, I've really, I've dabbled in a whole lot of things like nutrition and homeobotanical therapy. And then lately in the last few years, probably since writing my book, The Art of Self-Love, it's really been a quest the last you know, six to 10 years on, again, that why do we have to go through tough times and what does it actually mean? Yeah. So lately I've been doing a whole lot of mind work around things like neuro-linguistic programming, hypnosis, and really getting to understand how we tick and what makes us put meaning into life situations, which then can calibrate into our physiology which then calibrates into our immunology, which then yes. calibrates into our health and wellness. So yeah, it's been a really wow. cool um, journey. Lots of ups, lots of downs. Yep. I'm not sitting here saying my life's been easy. I've been through a lot of nope. things myself. <laughs> and knowing that often hitting the rock bottom parts of life whilst you're in it, the worst thing is to think that there's a lesson in this and, oh my gosh, I'm going to be coming out so amazing when you're in the throes <laughs> of it. If someone even suggests yeah. that you're going to have come out of face. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but we all know when we look back on our lives, dear Lisa, there is always a learning. There is yeah. always an opportunity for growth. But you can take it one of two ways. You can turn it into a power part of your life or a pity part of your life. You can become the victor or the victim. Yep. And that's where I love oh, working with people lovely. who choose the victor strategy. You know, how do I learn from this? Wow, the victor strategy. You either become a victim or a victor. I love that. That's just so beautifully put, Kim. And, and yeah, we've both been through rocky roads, and, and most people have if you get to our age. You know, you've had some shit thrown at you <laughs> from life. Um, some of your own doing, some of your not your own doing. Uh, and it is, okay, what can we learn out of this and how can we grow from this so that we just are able to carry on? And we were talking before about you know the journey I've been on with losing my dad six months ago or seven months ago and and how you know trying to stand back up from that and trying to make something positive out of the horrific situation which you know I'm still it's too, still too fresh to 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 fully have that formed but it, you know it will be his legacy well he will have a legacy because of this and I believe that he's helping me on the other side you know I'm pretty damn sure of that that he's making things happen in the, in the, the good time um, but we all go through these things and we all go through times where we think I can't get up again so you've written a book called The Art of Self-Love and you do a heck of a lot of, you have a podcast uh, all around the space of loving yourself. And, and this isn't just woo-woo stuff. This is real stuff. 
you know, this is like, how do I accept myself, love myself, learn from this, grow from this? What you And you've had some amazing people on your show, some amazing guests. What are some of the things that you've learned just in the last, you know, year working on your podcast and so on? Oh, it's been phenomenal. And I think the biggest thing that I love is you are the result of the five people you spend your most time with. So that includes family. And sometimes yeah. that can be tough. So therefore, the most important thing of all is, look, we can have a significant event happen in our lives that can bring us to our knees, which causes a whole lot of emotional trauma. Then we perceive that event and then depending on our upbringing, our circumstances, our values, our beliefs, our meta programs, how we generalize, distort and delete things, how we actually filter for what we're thinking of that meaning, then creates a physiology within the body, yeah. which then creates a state and then our emotions come out, which then drives our behavior. Yep. So it's fascinating. And the way I can explain this is if you grew up with siblings um, and you had the privilege of having the same, say the same mum and dad the whole way through, if you asked each of the siblings what they thought of their childhood, you may find a very different uh, perception or meaning of what they've put onto that. And that's based on the filter system. Wow. And we all know that between the ages of naught and seven is pretty much the imprinting stage. So whatever happens usually in those naught to seven years, um, we create meaning. We're, a fil we're an, abs an absorber of information. Yeah. Yeah. So if you grew up with a mum that was frantic and full on and was doing the best she could, and let's face it, everybody's done the best they could with the resources they have or don't have. But let's say you heard as a little four-year-old girl, your mum and dad fighting one night, they were having an argument and let's say it was about money. Maybe your dad just lost his job. But as a four-year-old, you don't understand all of this. But you come to the door because you're worried and you can hear and it doesn't yeah, feel right. Feel yeah. And then your dad says to you, go away. Um, this is not to do with you. Or says something of that. You've heard it in a way that now means you now go into your room, you calibrate that into your physiology that the next time a male or a man shouts, you've taken it to mean perhaps you're not good enough yep. or it's your fault. Yep. Now, you can imagine throughout your life now, you start building scenarios. Your reticular wow. activation system is mm. now on alert mm -hmm. that now every time you hear a man or a male argue or fight or scream yep. or yell or have anger, you're now drawn to it. So you're now filtering for it because also on the other side of that, because for, to have a problem, you also have to not have a problem or to have heat, you also have to have cold to understand the polarities of that. You now also know that to look for love in your life, you're now going to look for the polarity opposite of that, yep. which is men yelling, or maybe it yep. could be in the form of your boss. It could be in yep. the form of a teacher. It could be in the form of a friend. You're going to be attracted to that. So it's, it fascinates me, Lisa, that the meaning we put into our early childhood can then become what our life becomes or doesn't become. Now, the cool thing about that is when you have awareness around it, you can also undo this. Undo it. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. if you've had this physiology or a life of not having great relationships and you've never, if we could take you back through hypnosis or through different timeline strategies and we can get you back to the place where you first put meaning and had a limiting belief around that, then we can easily take the lessons from it, learn it and undo everything, or at least, and it's not wow. about unwinding you or stopping those memories. It's not about that. It's just realizing why you've created a certain behavior yep. to have that result. And the thing I love about it is that when you realize it and have an awareness around who you are and what you've been doing, the world becomes your oyster and we yep. stop blaming. We stop becoming the victim. We stop being in denial. We stop um, making excuses for our life. And we actually take accountability, responsibility and ownership yep. for every single thing. Now that wow. means we're things that happen to us, like you just said. So again, it doesn't matter what happens to you. It's your reaction to it that matters. It's how you perceive it that matters because we can't control our outside world as much as we've tried to change partners and kids and parents and families and friends. We as much can't. as we've tried to change yep. people, do any of us want to be changed or told we're doing it wrong? Probably not. No. So it actually teaches you a way on how to perceive it in a way that you do it with love. And as far as I'm concerned, 
I can speak to the biggest scientists on the planet. I can speak to the most intelligent humans on this planet. And ultimately, we, it all comes back to us desiring the ability to love and yep, be loved. And to be loved. And that is the whole purpose of us being here. I'm pretty damn sure of it. <laughs> if we, if we, you know, without going into the whole spiritual side, that's what I've been looking at. You know, uh, you know, when you lose a loved one, you start looking at what's on the other side and I, what what is the reason of life. And I, I do think it is all connected to, to love. That is so fascinating. I just um, met a, a Dr. Don Wood, who I'm going to introduce you to, uh, who works with trauma and people who have been through trauma. And he said, we have have this like you know he talks about the reticular activating system and how we filter for things and I can so relate to that that analogy that you 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 gave there um and he gave a, a story in his life with his wife who'd had a you know a, a difficult childhood um and um a dad who would do a lot of yelling and and so then he, he said his wife was hyper vigilant to that in his voice even if he just said oh I don't like that and she would immediately be filtering for that <gasps> what have I done wrong you know because of that fear response that it was already programmed into her and he talks about then taking these memories and, that, and that it could be a minor trauma but it ends up being a big thing that you frame yourself on at you know and limit your beliefs and I think like when you're a child, you don't have the understanding of, you know, mum might have been just a bit stressed and told you she was, you know, you're just a naughty little girl, you know, and then you've just taken that away and I'm a bad person forever and a day now. It's in my, you know, like it can be that simple. And yet it was just mum having a bad day and, you know, was a bit stressed and yelled at you, you know, which really shouldn't have had that impact. And as an adult, you wouldn't have taken that. But as a child, you've you've not been able to filter that so what he does he says and and also with big trauma you know he's worked with lots of vets and people that have been blowing up and bombs and lost legs and you know horrible things he says you have this memory that is in like high definition movie and it's trauma right and it's like so real and vivid in your in your memory banks and anything can trigger it. So it might be a song, a smell, a person, a, an event, and it will just, you are immediately back there in that trauma and you're reliving it. And that creates an emotional response in the body. And what he what he does through his program is, is it similar to with the, the hypnosis, I imagine, is take that high definition movie and turn it into a black and white picture. That's still in your brain, but no longer causes this physiological response because we get in the stuck in this loop where we're looping around those thoughts and the, the, that experience and experiencing it in real time because you, your brain doesn't differentiate if this was 20 years ago or it's now. If you think back to a horrible event in your life that was really traumatic for you, for you, you will have all of those physiological responses in real time right now because the brain doesn't know. Uh, you, 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 you're actually bringing it out into your body. And this is where the whole thing about psychoneuroimmunology comes into it, where everything that's going on in our brain affects and is stuck in our biology and expresses through our biology. Uh, and you, you've obviously been deeper into this world than I have of late. I'm, I'm only just scratching the surface. But how do you think that that affects us from a health perspective? If you think we are made up of 50 trillion cells and every one of those cells is communicating and it's got a whole incredible unconscious way of uh, sustaining life. And when we think about it consciously, I mean, you're not thinking about your left fingernail growing right now, although you might be now because I've brought attention to it. But unconsciously, so much is happening because of the programming, because of the ability of the body to do what it does and create what we call homeostasis. So if you have a traumatic experience and you get triggered by that, let's say, well, I've got a girlfriend who was in, sadly, her story is amazing. I'll get you to get her on your podcast. But basically, she lost her fiance to suicide she was so traumatized but within a year she just couldn't get over it so she decided on his one year anniversary she'd go to Bali to take her life she had two girlfriends who um, knew 
that she wasn't right. So they went with her. That night they went out to the Sari Club and we all may be aware of the Bali bombings that went off. Mm. Now, one minute Karen's thinking of going to Bali to take her life. The next minute she's pushed through a burning wall and running for her life. So her physiology, and by the way, she lost her two friends out of that experience. So now she feels responsible for three people's deaths. So you can imagine for her what that meant. And she, her story is phenomenal as she goes into a a world of six years of depression. Mm -hmm. Now, what brings her out of it is obviously a lot of self-work, but her dad talking about, you know, his nickname for her is Buffy. And he says to her, he had her on his knee. She's a, you know, she's a woman in her late thirties at this point. And he has her sitting on her knee and says, you know, Buffy, we've all got to, sometime the caterpillar's got to go through a transformational process to come out the other side and become the butterfly and um and for some reason maybe he'd been saying it for those six years but for some reason on that day she heard it and she has gone on this exploratory path of what is it that has us physiologically turn into this thing called depression and these are her words not mine she believes depression is a choice So she says, you go to sleep every night, you fall asleep, you might be depressed as you fall asleep, but as you go to sleep into the unconscious part of sleep, you are no longer depressed. But the minute, not the minute, the moment you wake up, you're not depressed until the memory kicks in of Mm -hmm. who you are, your story in your life. And now all of a sudden you're living depression. Now I'm not undermining depression for anyone listening. And Mm. I'm certainly not an expert in that field, but I found it interesting Mm -hmm. that she feels depression is a choice. So, you know, when you think about that, your biology and what's happening at a physiological level that you say as a cell level If you are believing, and by the way, the reason why I said that is um, if a balloon popped or a champagne cork went off, the explosion of that triggered her exactly into that time and place. Absolutely. So, you know, it takes time, effort and energy and real work on self to overcome these traumas. Now, we're not born with a with a, a rule book or a guidebook and our parents aren't born with a book no. on how to help us psychologically. I mean, we're all traversing this pathway with the best that we possibly can. And so I share that in the hope and realization that for many of us, you know, suicide is not the answer. And I say that with a disclaimer that it's really important that in these times of worry and fear and stress and overwhelm, that you seek help if you're feeling like your world is closing in. Mm -hmm. You're not your own coach. You're not your own best coach. Your partner's not necessarily the best coach or mentor for you Mm -hmm. through these times. Neither are your parents. So sometimes we need professional help. And what I love about these days is if you were seeing a psychologist in my mum's day, you were seeing as a little bit weak. Yes. Whereas today, it's rubbish. Yeah, you are. <laughs> se- I think you're seen as profoundly intelligent, emotionally intelligent to get yes. that support. So whether it's hypnosis, aromatherapy, psychology, uh, NLP, getting a coach, getting a yep. mentor, it doesn't matter what it is. And there's Just a lot a of free help yep. out there if you search it in podcasts like this mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. really dive into one one realm we could go down the science link but my real passion sits in the heart space and if you love who you are then I believe you have awareness when you're not in love with yourself and if you take care of yourself then we know that that helps you one step one moment one breath at a time you're better off doing something nice for yourself making a green smoothie than you are drinking a bottle of wine Mm. I'm not saying that a bottle of wine with a girlfriend and pouring (laughs) your heart out and having a good cry isn't healthy either, (laughs) but it's not your crutch. (laughs) It's not to become your crutch, right? So anything can become a crutch too. You know, anything can become an addiction. Yeah. And an addiction is not a great place to be either. So Mm. we know that um, if you can find a way, one step, one breath at a time, whether it's free or if you have the money to invest, and let's face it, most people's biggest excuses for why they don't work on themselves is time and money. And I'm here to tell you that I think it's absolute bullshit, that (laughs) it's not time and money. It's about whether or not you make yourself a priority, because we all know if you, let, let me say this to your listeners, if someone you loved was hanging off a cliff 
And it meant that in order to save them, you had to have a weekly massage until the end of this year. <laughs> you to save them, you would find the time and the money to do it. Now that might seem a bit extreme, yeah. but I promise you, when you are faced with like you have been with your mum and your dad, everything goes aside until you put that at the forefront. So it's about prioritization. Yeah. And the moment you're even guilty for that. Except, well, then when we look at guilt, sometimes that even that emotion of guilt is an interesting one. So we feel guilt because we're doing something for ourselves, um, which is taking away from something else, perhaps. And mm. even that's interesting. So when I look at the emotion of guilt, it's because we're doing something maybe selfishly. Well, what if we could reframe that into investing in ourselves as a mum, putting a child into daycare or... Um, you know, having a babysitter every now and again so that you can go out or going for a weekly massage. If we look at that as guilt, if you really look at this, this is something interesting and I just want you to think about this, that mother guilt, is it that we're using that as a frame to hide the fact that some days being a mother is freaking hard work <laughs> and some days we actually may hate it and some yep. days maybe we are so exhausted, so mentally, physically, emotionally exhausted that we hate it so much that we then feel bad because we've yelled, we've screamed, we've not yep. been the best version of ourselves and then we put it into mother guilt, we frame it in that, whereas some days we just freaking we don't like it yeah. and I think if we could own those emotions more and own the fact that it doesn't feel great some days and own it but with power not victim mentality then I think we would actually be more honest and we would actually say and that's when I, I always say have a bestie that you can call who's not going to go into the gossip um, yeah, yeah, victim yeah. mentality but the yeah. I'm hearing your girlfriend yeah. <laughs> and then at the end of that you say what do you want to do about it and what's yeah. your purpose for this belief or this feeling right now and what can you learn from it to have a girlfriend or a mate or a partner or a friend who says what can we learn from this is one of the best friends you could have in your corner that is psychotherapy and psychology at its best yeah. what can you learn from this and sometimes it's very hard to look at the lessons when you're in the throes of it and when yeah. emotions are high, intelligence is very low. Wow. So that might not be the question that we ask when someone's highly volatile and emotional, but to be a good listener, to hear someone pour their heart out. Often as we talk it to someone that's listening, truly listening without trying to fix us, when you're listening, we often talk through the process out loud because I believe all humans have all traits and all humans have all resources within them to help heal themselves. But sometimes we just need to hear it. And I don't know about you, Lisa, but sometimes as I'm talking through my problem, yeah. I realize how stupid it is or how <laughs> benign it sounds yep. or how relatively, how relatively benign it is compared to what someone else is going through. So to have a good listening friend or to be that listening friend is sometimes one of the best um, fast track pathways into self care, which motorizes you right into the heart of self love. Yeah, but, 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 but here's my third thing. Yeah, I'm going to put a caveat on that. That takes discipline. Yeah, without discipline, you can care for yourself and go into the airy fairy land of of woe and spirituality and and oh my gosh, this is all teaching me lots without responsibility. Yep. Then that is not serving you. The discipline of waking up every day and physically doing something with that beautiful vehicle of yours with 50 trillion cells, yeah, yeah. whether it's five minutes of, you know tricep dips and push-ups just in your bedroom <laughs> before you get dressed yep. or whether it's going for a 30 minute walk or whether it's push and pushing yourself we know the physiology of pushing the body yep. actually puts you out of your comfort zone which changes your cell structure yep. and when you change that you get more clarity and when you have more clarity you make better decisions and as you get to know yourself more and understand the triggers in your life your responses the victim mentality you start to realize that you don't stop having problems you just have better problems Lisa yeah, yeah. so you might be having a problem that's hmm, I'm not sure whether I should run in the Gold Coast hinterland this weekend because I've got the weekend off or whether your problem is trying to emotionally deal with the fact that your father never told you he loved you well they're both you know problems 
but I can tell you which problem I'd rather be traversing and working out because I've worked out the fact that maybe, and this isn't me personally, but my dad didn't tell me I lo he loved me, or maybe I experienced a very significant abuse, or maybe I had a traumatic experience that now I'm working on I'm to working understand on. Yeah. what it meant to me. And I think you'd agree with me. Every person you've had on your podcast or every person you've ever met, the ones we admire and love the most are the ones that have actually gone to hell and back. Absolutely. But they've found a way so out. Interesting. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> it's the comeback story, right? Yeah, Go yeah. Google um, The Hero's Journey um, by Joseph Campbell. It's a six-minute video to watch. We all go through The Hero's Journey where we, got, we want adventure. We want to go out on a limb. We want to do things. But then we find dragons and, and people putting us down or pulling us out. And then we traverse through that hardship and it, we come out battered and beaten beaten and torn and spat out but as we come through that we realize the adventure becomes amazing treasure and through the treasures we find we expand and evolve and as we expand and evolve we become a better human and oh my gosh we then go on a new adventure oh my gosh yeah, there's more the dragons case. there's <laughs> more <laughs> people <laughs> spitting on us and things but that is the circle of life right yeah, yeah, and yeah. if we could just understand it that it's at our darkest times we actually are revealed. Your strength comes through, your courage, your determination, your tenacity, your resilience is what shows up. Or you have the potential to discover when we go through it. Because when life's great, it's great. And we don't tend you to don't push learn. ourselves so much <laughs> when it's great. And that's the cool thing. We get to have a rest when life's great. I always say this to people when I'm speaking, you know, and I say this with hand on heart, to those of you going through a tough time, I have something for you this too shall pass. Yes. And everyone looks at me. It's one of my me. favorite sayings in the world. Absolutely. And then I also say, and to those of you in a really good place in your life, I've got some advice for you. Mm. This, this too, too shall, shall pass. pass. <laughs> so we know that life is ebb and flow, yeah. high and low, in and out, dark and light. If we wow. could come to accept that, then that is self-love. That is realizing that actually when life's good, I'm going to learn more. I'm going to listen to different podcasts. I'm going to maybe study something. I'm going to read something. I'm going to read something. for. Every, and I say read, not on a technology thing. I mean a book. Read a book. I'm going to immerse myself. I'm going to go to a, a retreat or a breakthrough or I'm going to take on coaching and mentoring because we don't want to just be great versions of ourselves. We want to be exceptional versions of ourselves. Yeah. And to do that, it's great to work on ourselves when life's great because because then when the life hits us or the storm, or I'll say you either get a tap, a whack or a mac. So you'll get a tap where someone taps you or something upsets you, or you'll get a whack where maybe you're thrown off guard and you can't, you've lost your job or your relationships over, or we get a Mack truck, major yeah, illness, losing someone. And it side swipes you to the point where you're on your knees and you can't breathe. Yeah. But if you've got those tools of resilience inside of you or you know where to go as you breathe through each moment, and let's face it, in order to heal it, you truly have to feel it. So that means we can't hide the emotions from any of these or that we say, oh, everything's great when it's freaking not. Owning it with power and not telling your story as a victim is painful, but owning it and then saying, but you know what, I'm going, I'm seeing someone or I'm doing this or I'm using my oils or I'm listening to this podcast with Lisa Tamadi and I've let, met, met this amazing supplement that I think is actually going to work for me right now. Whatever you hear, don't take it for granted and always trust that what you're hearing in the moment is a beautiful sign. There's always signs and opportunity of growth, passion, love and development. It just depends what your reticular activation system is filtering for and whether you're looking for the good or more of the shit that you've just been through. Explain that RAS, Kim. What is that? Well, we know there's a part of the brain that has memories, it has filters, it has this whole belief system. Well, let's let's look at it this way. What what's your favorite car? Or what's a car you dream to own if you don't have it right now? Oh, is there God. one? Oh, no, not really You're probably not cars. that materialistic. <laughs> no, no, but no, let's no, use no, it as an example. A Twenty year old car. Um, <laughs> uh, let's just say a Ferrari, just for the a sake Ferrari. of it's a red Ferrari. A red yeah. Ferrari. Yeah. Sometimes we could call that a penis extension or yes. a midlife crisis <laughs> awakening. But anyway, we'll, yes, we'll go for it. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> or what's a nice car you like? Um, oh, I like Jaguars. Jaguars. Let's Jaguars go more there. And what nice. color? 
Um, a wine coloured one. A wine coloured. So that beautiful burgundy wine coloured. Yeah, not Jaguar. very common, probably. So probably not a good example, but you know what I mean. However, <laughs> it's now in your mindset. It's now in your memory. It's now in your reticulator activation system. It's now as part, it's become out of the 2 million bits of information we receive each day, we actually only have access to 136 bits. Yep. So I want you to think about that. 2 million bits of information is coming at you but we are actually only able to process 136 in our bits consciousness yeah in our consciousness because if you think about it so to access and process 2 million bits we'd be in constant burnout and yeah. overwhelm yeah yeah so those 136 bits now we've just spoken about a burgundy colored jaguar that's come really close into the forefront of your reticular activation system so you may find over the next 24, 48 hours, that you, you might them. just happen to see one. Yeah. And, and that's, that's because you're now filtering for yeah. it. You've yeah. got the 136 bits have now said, and if particularly if we put it to the front of our values and it became a value, let's say, and let's say a car is not necessarily a high value, no. but being able to transport yourself or take people to and from places, or you love adventure and, and traveling and you, you have a real high value for adventure, a car is part of that. Mm -hmm. And so now adventure is one of the highest values on your list of life values. And within that is, if we dig deeper, is the burgundy color Jaguar. Now you're actually going to see it. Every time you're thinking of adventure, you might think now, actually, bloody damn it, I've worked really hard. I deserve this. And now all of a sudden you start seeing ads for for Jaguars yep. or you yep. start seeing things. That's what we mean about pulling in the 136 bits of information into the reticular yep. activation system. And now you're seeing it. Now you're proving it. And this is now, why goal setting works, isn't it? Because you set a goal and you've, you've made that as a priority. So it's a big, scary one. And then everything that will help you get towards your goal, your subconscious is picking up those things and then saying, hey, be aware of this. You know, so if you decide you want to run a marathon, it's probably a good example with us two crazy runners um, or ex crazy runners. Um, you start to seeing articles about running and uh, videos on running and in every and then you'll be uh, aware of runners running around your neighborhood that you might not have you might have ignored before because suddenly this has become a goal and so your brain is going oh you wanted this well I'm just making you aware of uh, the here's some tools to get there so that's a really good example of the you know the RAS in action really. Yeah, and you've got to remember too and I want to make this really clear something that I've learned just lately if you have a goal to run a marathon and it's really high on your priorities and you start off in the first week and you're doing the pro, there's maybe there's 12 week program. Maybe they're doing one of your, yours and Neil's program. Maybe they've got one of these things and they're in week one. They're highly enthusiastic and excited. Week two, they're a bit sore and it's hurting a bit and they've had DOMS setting in and now it's like, it's not getting easier. In fact, actually, the more you train, the more you realize the better, you, even though you don't realize you're getting better and stronger, you're pushing yourself more because, and so you're feeling worse. So by the by, week three, usually within those 21 days, we're starting to go, yeah, maybe a marathon isn't the goal at all. Or <laughs> you still keep saying it's a marathon, but now you're not going out for the longer runs. Now what's happened is your goal is not matching your value. Now this is the real essence of the work how do we make now running a marathon one of your highest values? If I elicited all your values, you may find health um, or adventure or um, pushing the limits or expanding yourself is number 10 on the list. Yeah. And therefore it, it won't get, it's done. not going to be, it's not going to get done, which is yeah. why so many of us, you know, we set new year's goals, we join a gym, we go along and then we basically make a donation to that gym for the rest mm -hmm. of the year. So, um, <laughs> The important thing to realize is that you have to have your goal align with your top three values. And yep. if it's not aligning with any of your top three values, you're going to need some integration work to bring it up there if it's something you really want. Because otherwise, that's where the excuses come in or you get an injury. Was it an injury or was your subconscious mind delivering you yep. that possibility so that you didn't have to do it? Yep. I find it health hurt. and injuries and disease and all of those things, I think if you've read Bruce Lipton's book, The Biology of Belief, you'll yes, know that it. what we believe, we perceive. Yes. And what we, uh, where, where focus goes, energy flows. So if you have all of these things in your mind, if your focus is now on all oh, sore and injury and it's too hard and I don't want to do it, bang, you 
you're going to find your energy goes that way, it flows that way, and hello, now you've got a reason and excuse to physically pull out of the marathon. Yeah. So, you know, people would say, oh, no, I didn't mean to trip over the, the washing basket. Well, how come for the last 365 days you've never, the washing basket could have been there, but you've it's never just seen it. Doing so, sabotaging. so the unconscious mind is one of the most powerful places to work, which is why I love hypnosis, which is yep. why I love timeline therapy, which is why I love getting into, and, and if you look at a mountain, the snow part on the top is your conscious mind. But in fact, everything yeah. underneath, which is driving your behavior, driving your feelings, your beliefs and your values is actually it's everything or the iceberg. That's right. 95% of it is definitely coming from the unconscious mind. Yeah. And this is why we need to do the deep work. And, you know, you just reminded me of a couple of things. Every time that I do a big, massive race in the past, I would get sick or I'd have an injury or something would happen in the usually in the week or two weeks before the actual event. And it was like my body's going, I'm going to stop you because I don't want you to do the part of me doesn't want to do it. Right. And so it's going, I'm going to chuck a few obstacles and you have to understand that when you override that and you keep going often, that injury or that niggle or that whatever that was disappears. And I saw, I saw that firsthand time and time again and even like when I was running through New Zealand and I was like doing 70 k's a day and I was getting weaker and sicker and really like just absolutely blown apart after two weeks and I didn't stop though because I had an amazing team and I had a big why but why I was doing this and charities and big you know responsibilities so I kept going despite horrific pain and all the rest of it and then my body went went oh she's not stopping we better get on board with this and it got stronger and stronger from the two-week point up until the six-week point I actually got stronger and stronger and I thought that it's all over that I could have like I was with walking sticks I was walking I wasn't running I was having to go down sideways down hills because my shins were so bad and when I still kept going then the brain went oh well we better get on with it because she's not going to stop, obviously. And that's a really good example. And, you know, one of the other things I wanted to bring up, because motivation follows action, not the other way around. Yes. So like when you don't feel like going training today, which is pretty much me every day, I don't feel <laughs> like it. <laughs> but I take action. I yes. do something. I might be just putting on my gym gear. I'm yes. gonna, and I've said this before, put on your gear, walk out the door, go to the letterbox and then see. And often when you've just taken that couple of steps of action, then you're in the movement and you're like, ah, oh, well, I'm out here now, I might as well go. And then it gets easier and easier and then you're in the flow of it. And it's, it's, that, it's that anticipation sometimes that stops you. And when you just get up and like doing the press-ups in the morning before I do anything else, you know, I go and have a, you know, a cold shower, I do my heart rate monitoring, my HRV and all the breath hold techniques. And then I come out of the shower and then I often do like my press-ups and stuff before I sit down at the computer because that's I've done that. And if you if you have little tiny habits that you build in, and it might be just 10 press-ups or 10 sit-ups every time you go to the loo, whatever the case may be, and you set these little wee micro goals that you can't fail at, and that action creates motivation because you've actually done a little bit and you're pleased with yourself and that recreate creates its own reward loop type of thing and a, a yeah. lot of what you were saying was just like oh, I was just like oh yeah that's exactly what I've you know <laughs> Paul Taylor who I've just had on my show who I'm going to introduce <laughs> to Dr. Dom Don Wood you know all of this is very very similar um, so Kim I want to go now into hypnosis because this is something that fascinates me I haven't I haven't studied it I want to it's on my to-do list at some point in time tell me how the heck does that work and what's involved with the hypnosis process Pretty cool. Like I, it, it's tapping directly into the unconscious mind, and I could use language with us right here and now, where I could get us all into a very relaxed state. And every breath that you're taking, we're getting more and more relaxed. And as we relax more, we learn more. And the more we learn, the more we hear. And as we're hearing new thoughts and opportunities, the more we realize we're capable of everything and anything. And that's because we're extraordinary. So as I talk like that, and as I speak to you like that, it's almost putting you into a subconscious trance, which kind of has your mind scrambling and not having to consciously think. And so your mind kind of goes on this beautiful journey. And it's wow. in that space 
where you, I believe, we tap into the heart space. And when we tap into the heart or the unconscious space, we can put new meanings past the critical factor, past that critical person who knocks you or puts you down all the time or that. And here's another question. If you hear yourself knocking yourself, who's talking? If you're listening, who's talking? And if it's you (laughs) saying it, who's listening? You know, so I love the rabbit hole of the unconscious mind because it gets you realizing that everything is about programming. Everything is programmed. And so we want to program excellence, which is why when we watch people who do amazing things, we want to model ourselves off them or we want to learn how they did it, which is why I love NLP and hypnosis together. But hypnosis really is the ability to tap into the unconscious mind, bypassing the critical factor so that we can get to the heart, the juice, the unconscious mind to create change so that when you come out the other side, you see possibility and opportunity, not all the negative shite that you were saying before we may have had the session. And I think it's just accessing that. We spend most of our time consciously thinking. Yet, as I said at the beginning, when was the last time you gave thanks to your fingernail for growing or your (laughs) digestive juices for doing what they're doing or your hair growing or those bald, maybe not growing, but, you know, (laughs) it's a really beautiful thing. And I think things like flotation tank, massage, um, um, times when you get to deeply, truly relax, when we let go of the physiology of tension around us, actually allows the cells to almost breathe Mm -mm. you know and if we if we breathe if you followed Wim Hof or any of the amazing work what breath or James Nestor his book I just oh I love it James I'll introduce you oh (laughs) James or Wim James and uh, Patrick McEwen as well oh god oh Patrick I love that book breath yeah. changed the way I looked at me breathing. I've been me taping too. my mouth at night yep. because, you know, we can go without food for months. Well, I've, I've heard of people go a year yep. without food. We can go weeks without water, but we can't go many seconds or many minutes without breath. No. <laughs> so, you know, breath is the, the essence of life. And when we go into a state of hypnosis, we are really letting go of the breath. And as we let go of the breath, we actually are able to access the intelligence of the cells, intelligence of the um, the high vibration. And without going too wacky, I guess the other way to look at it is that we operate, you know, we're aware that we can measure the speed of life, light. Um, I can't remember the exact measurement of it right now, but it's bloody fast. Yep. But everything below that is all measurable. And from a conscious level, we understand it. You know, we've got vibrational frequency of plants, of oils, of of food. We we understand that there's a vibrational frequency to all things. But above the speed of light, where we go into the zero point field of quantum physics and true possibility and infinity, that's where the mind just, it's so big and so bizarre (laughs) <laughs> that you actually can't do anything but surrender to it and feel all possibility. And I guess the way to look at that, to try and bring it into some realm, is if if we put one of our blood cells, if we put blood under a microscope, we would go down and we'd see there's a whole lot of cells. And then we'd go further into the cell. Yep. And then we'd see a whole cell. And within the cell is a whole lot of stuff and life yep. and you know, proteins and cytoplasm and DNA and RNA. And we go, but then if we go right into the DNA and RNA, we go further into that, you'll see there's even more microcosms of cells and systems and structure. And if you keep going, the more you go, the more you see, there is nothing but space. There's only vibration. And space. And then there's just the vibration. And this is science. Like this is not, there is nothing there. We're not solid. We're not. We just energy. And we could do it to the chair you're sitting on. Yeah, we could, we could slice solid. through a piece of that. And when the yep. more we go into each of yep. the wooden chairs or this chair that you're sitting on structure, you'll see that that becomes nothing. Yeah. And we can go the other way where we go up into us here right now from the cells into our blood system, to our body, to our human system, to our environment, to our uh, community, to our environment of the of the the. the 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 place we live into the planet then we go beyond the planet into the galaxy and then we realize the galaxies beyond the galaxies all of a sudden we're back to nothing yeah (laughs) so we can go macro or micro but the joy of this ride into quantum physics is that it means that everything means nothing and nothing is no thing and no thing is everything and everything is something and when I start doing that with my mind it is (laughs) 
<laughs> it makes you realize that actually, if I bring it right back into that significant emotional event that occurred when I was a five-year-old girl, I just, through my own filter systems, through my own values, beliefs, and upbringing, my personality, and all of those meta programs going on, I made it mean something. Mm -hmm. And I love this idea. What if life had no meaning and it had no meaning that it had no meaning? Wow. What if we could actually realize that everything we think is true is actually just a limiting belief of perception of our idea of reality? Mm -hmm. That in fact, the only reality, the only truth I could actually give you right here, right now, is that you and I both know, there's two truths probably. One truth is that the sun will come up tomorrow. Whether we see it or not, it's another thing, but we do know it's a truth. The sun will come up tomorrow. And the other truth is we will all die at some point. But even that's up for debate because do yeah. we die do or we do die? we go to another realm oh, of which we God. then have past and future lives and soul journeys? So yeah. I don't know. I don't Multiverses know. Multiverses. Just... <laughs> oh, we could go like a huge, and I'm, you know, I'm fascinated by quantum physics, you know, and, 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 and most of it, to be honest, is beyond my grasp as a little brain, you know, that obviously, but I know that there's, there's bigger things out there and it's, I'd just, I'd love to riff with you for a couple of hours on, on, on this subject, but we're probably like, people will be going, what the hell are they talking about? But what it, I'd love to say though, is be, just to, to finish off that is just realize that everything you've ever experienced is just a belief it's yeah. not truth it's or it's just a perception situation. so it's never the truth it's mm -hmm. it's always up for, based on how you believe and see and perceive the world which is why there's conflict which is why we have arguments but wouldn't it be beautiful if I could put just for a minute put my shoe try because I never could but if I put my shoes and feet into your shoes just for a moment and imagine it from your perception your beliefs and your reality I actually have more understanding yeah, and more empathy. I may not agree with it. I may not like it, but my gosh, it's interesting that it's from your perspective. Mm -hmm. So every time we feel ourselves triggered or every time we feel ourselves going into a place of, you know, anger or frustration or guilt or sadness or whatever that driving emotion is, rather than sitting in the whirlpool of mud pit of it, ask yourself this question, for what purpose am I feeling this? Why? Or even just the question, why? Why am I sad? Well, I'm sad because he said that. Why does what he says make you sad? Well, because it's not fair. Why is not fear not fair? Well, because I don't feel like I'm listened to. Why is it important that you're listened to? Because I feel so alone. Why are you feeling alone? Because I don't love myself. Mm -hmm. And if you really go to the core of all of it, I promise you, it almost gets back to the fear of not being loved or the fear of not being accepted. That's what everything that drives these emotions and our behaviors comes from. Wow. Yeah, that is just absolutely amazing. And it's all automatic. Like we have these, you know, as Dr. Daniel Amen uh, talks about these automatic negative thoughts that just pop up all the time. And if we can separate ourselves out from our own brain, you know, our own subconscious, our own programming, and just observe how these automatic thoughts just keep coming at you all the time. And then if you let them go, they'll go again. Or know that those negative thoughts are part of the human experience. They yes. are actually from an evolutionary they had a um, anthro anthropological development point of view. We had to be on alert for the same yes. tooth tiger. Had we to, had to yeah. be watching Hyper for our vigilant. tribe or our kids. We had to be that. But we actually spiked ourselves into sympathetic dominance very quickly with that yep. but in years gone by we also pushed ourselves very quickly back down into parasympathetic um yep. place yes. where we had peace and, we rest and digest yes. whereas today we're living in the sympathetic dominance world and so i just say with you you know as the negative thought comes in even ask that question why am i thinking that and keep doing mm -hmm. that i always say ask seven whys Seven and be wise. really honest with yourself. Ask seven whys. Why did I feel that? Why am I thinking that? I remember my grandmother. Here's another nice way of saying it. I was driving down the freeway once. This is years ago when she was still alive. She immigrated from New Zealand to Australia at 90 years of age. So I always say to people, oh, if you yeah. think you're too old for anything, I always go, nah, um, that's a belief. That's a limiting belief, right? Um, so anyway, we're driving down the freeway. I was driving her back to King Roy where she was living over here. 
And she always used to put her hand on my knee and she'd say, Penny for your thoughts. And this particular day, I obviously had my, you know, my jaw was clenched and I was like, I said, oh, Grandma, I can't talk about this one. And she said, oh, sweetheart, come on, a problem shared is a problem half solved. So I turned the music up so the children couldn't hear behind me. They were in their car seats. And I leaned in trying to say, Grandma, I had this terrible thought. I'm going to have a car accident, a head-on car accident. And the awful thing about that is that I've just read a book called The Secret, which is all about the law of attraction. And the more you think it, the more you might attract it. And she went, oh, <laughs> darling, that must be awful. I said, it's terrible. Anyway, she goes, oh, darling, you know, sometimes when we have a thought like that, did you ever stop to think that maybe it's your angels just asking you to drive more carefully? <laughs> and so ever since she said that, whenever I've had a negative thought come in like, oh, I don't feel like going for a run. God, you're useless. Why aren't you going for a run? <laughs> I then go, oh, maybe my angels are asking me to go for a walk today instead. Or maybe it's just important I go outside and earth on the sand or the or the grass and just yeah. take three deep breaths and say something. Maybe the angels are just saying to me, your body do doesn't something. feel like a good run today, but do something more gentle, be more gentle. And I think having that reframe ability is one of the most powerful things we can do as humans wow, on this planet what today. what a wise nana you had. Yeah. <laughs> and especially when you know, you have a history, you've got a world record as being well, the, the youngest to do 24-hour racing uh, what sort of distance uh, did you it do? was, it was I only did, I, well it's nothing to these days now I ran 100 miles in less than 24 hours and yeah, I that was the is youngest not nothing <laughs> and that is crazy like I know what that takes <laughs> on a 400 meter track <laughs> yes I know exactly what that takes um and, and so you know you we're not you're not coming from this from a, a place of laziness you're coming <laughs> from this of place of of of, of uh being sensible and listening to your body and, and tuning into that. And I love what your Nana said. I think what your, your grandma said, what, what, a, what an amazing lady. Yeah. You know, there's um, uh, another thing I just heard, we'll wrap it up in a second because um, I have to go and pick up my mummy. Um, but uh, Paul Taylor talks, who's, who I'm going to introduce you to, who's doing all this crazy stuff and he's been on the podcast. He talks about these two characters that you have in your head and he gets you to draw them, you know, your, your epic uber you and your not so great you you know the one that's negative the one that's always you know pulling you down and you actually put them into figures that you actually draw little cartoon bubbles and what are they saying to you and by doing this you're you're creating the distance to make it real it, it, it puts it into a like a cartoon perspective of what's actually going on in your brain and this fight because otherwise it's very ethereal it's you know that you are part of you wants to be this amazing good person doing these amazing credible things and pushing outside your boundaries and being brave and the other part of you is just wants to crawl up in bed and be negative and horrible <laughs> you know so and, and, you and the beautiful there, thing of that just on that note is we could call that shadow or golden shadow and if you don't wow. ask uh, if you asked the seven wise to each of those characters you will be amazed, and this is why I love the work that I do, is that they both actually have the same purpose. Oh, wow. To protect they're you. They're both to protect you, to guide you, to <laughs> love you. They just don't know the best way. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And sometimes it's it's beautiful to actually integrate the two together as yep. well. I just wanted to add that. I think that's great because that's what that, that negative one, if you think about why is it telling you something negative because it's scared. You can't run a marathon. Who do you think you are? You're not good enough to do that. That's the negative voice speaking. It's a negative little Lisa that didn't go like, you know. And then the other ones, yes, you can. I know you can make it. Come on, keep going. And that when you put that into the perspective of why is that negative voice saying, because it doesn't want you to fail. It doesn't want you to get hurt. It's like your overprotective mother who's actually holding you back from what you can achieve. And then yes. you've got the other one on the other side, the mum that's going come on, you can do that. And, and I'm, I'm cheering for you. Uh, and, and just understanding that this process is going on in our heads. And as runners, we know that voice very, very well, because when you've been 100 miles out there, it's screaming, that negative voice is screaming at you to stop. You know, it's so funny with that. I, I, you'll, I'll just finish with this one. But I remember running this, this world record race. And I remember this voice inside of my head for the first, probably, I'll be honest, first probably 14 hours of the race. It was yeah. going, you're a dick. You're <laughs> a dog. What a stupid thing to do. Who does this? Do this? You're never going to do this. What? A, a, you're a dog. You know, all of these things I'm saying. <laughs> and, and then I'd go, oh, shut up. And I'd carry on. I'd do this thing. Anyway, finally at about, we call it the graveyard shift, you know, between yeah. 12 and 6 a.m. Cool. And this doctor comes out, puts me on the scales. And I was looking terrible. I was dragging my sorry butt around the track. And he puts me on the scales and he goes, I'm sorry, Kim, you've lost seven kilos, nearly seven kilos. We're going to have to take you out of the race. Um, yeah. it, it would 
would be wrong of me to let you race. And in that yep. moment, this voice went, you can't tell me yeah, I can't no. run. You can't tell me I can't do this. And, and I begged him to let me to stay in the race. So for 14 hours, I've been fighting it. Then someone yep. tells me I can't do can't. it. This voice turns around and goes, you can't tell me what to do. And then he said to me, you're going to have to listen to your team. You're going to have to eat all this stuff. You're going to have to take these supplements. You're going to da, 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 da. And then I ended up rising above it and then setting a world record. And then when they said to me, I'd set a world record, I turned around and I, while I was receiving the trophy, I sat there and I thought, imagine what I could have done if I hadn't spent four <laughs> hours off the track whinging. <laughs> I <laughs> feel that energy being sucked into that negativity right? and I still haven't worked out how to shut that up completely it's no. <laughs> but that's a rebellious nature that comes out when anybody tells me I can't do something it's like <laughs> is that right red rag to a ball <laughs> I think that's why I love so much with my, um, you know, the, the ment I have a mentorship program where I have women every week coming into this and every Tuesday night they show up with me and, and I pull their minds apart and I give them the, and I dance with it because now I have such a love wow. of this work yeah. that we do that. And then I'm super pumped that we now have uh, live events happening, which are the essential self-care yeah. weekends, Tell which us. then are the immersion events, you know, because for many of us to learn this, it's really kind of, it takes a process, but imagine immersing yourself into it for a whole weekend. Wow. And sometimes I think we make greater shifts in it by immersion rather than week by mm -hmm. week or month by month. And I'm only sharing this because I, I know that, you know, a lot of your listeners are around the world. The one's in on the Sunshine Coast and one's going to be down in Victoria. Victoria and Melbourne but I just I just want people to know that it doesn't have to be my event but look at something around you what's going on even if it's someone doing a library talk someone's yep. offering um something at the local podcast hotel a YouTube podcast at yep. YouTube like just keep your mind stimulated with possibility because Absolutely. it's through the possibility we have growth Educate and through yourself. the growth we become way more powerful individuals and yep. with that we start to then look at our higher purpose and what legacy are we going to leave in this life yep, if, yep, that's, yep. if that's and, the way and look keep at it. being curious and yeah. I would really encourage anyone who wants to um, reach out to Kim and do, maybe join her mentorship program where you're doing that um, every week and, yes. that, and that's ridiculously good price like it's super good value so if you want to reach out to Kim and join uh, her mentorship program there or join her in one of the, your retreats, um, we'll give all the details in the show notes. But just briefly, Kim, where can people find out about you, contact you, ask you about all the, all the work that you do, your books and so on? So two places. Thank you so much. I so appreciate you asking because I just, I really want this work out. We're going to get this really work want, out there. Yeah. I really want people to know the more love they have for themselves, the yeah, more they have to offer. Lives, Kim. Um, but to really to look it up, KimMorrisonTraining.com is where you'll find the mentorship stuff, but also my beautiful products and oils, which I use throughout the whole time, <clears throat> excuse me, is 28.com, the word 20 and the number 8.com. You can find me on Instagram, Kim Morrison and the number 28. I love Instagram. I love being there. But I really, you know, just even if you just wanted to have a chat or to see if the work that I do, even the one-on-one -on -one mentoring that I offer, there's some breakthrough sessions that I now do that is a real eight-hour deep dive. You oh me for eight hours straight or we break it up into two four hours but my gosh do we have breakthroughs yeah um but there's a whole lot of stuff plus i do international retreats and i'm launching later this year my spa immersion and integration which is success purpose alignment immersion so that will be later this year which i'm super pumped and excited for Thanks, those that are really live oh i just i'm so pumped you when i have see, a rest <laughs> you speak for yourself oh my god talk about you see what you see in an another is totally present in yourself so I see you and I go wow and I see and realize and appreciate and respect it's because we have this beautiful duality of love for one another so yeah, we do I think we definitely amazing. do you're a very, very special person yeah and, and and I've got that little negative voice in my head going you're not as good as Kim because she's doing all of that <laughs> why are you having the other that one going yeah exactly and the other <laughs> side's going Yes, you freaking are. You're awesome. You're doing Thank amazing you. stuff too. But this Thank is like, you. and this is a classic example. I had to give that example now because it's quite funny, you know. And and when you when you're self aware enough to crack up at your own stupidity, <laughs> but I really encourage people. Kim Morrison Training dot com and twenty the word twenty eight dot com dot com word twenty and the number eight dot number com. eight dot com. Yeah. 
Perfect. Check out what Kim does. Thank you so much, my dear friend. Oh, I love I'm you having and you on. thank you for you all the work perfect. you do. And I'm going to talk to that beautiful little inner critic right now. <laughs> and she's just protecting you because she knows how much work it takes to do all of this work. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And she's just saying to you, maybe rock, not right now is the time <laughs> to be launching all those other ideas you've got in your head. Because I know we talked about it off air. Stop yes. it. <laughs> yes, stop overreaching. <laughs> Kim, thank you so much for your time today. You've been absolutely epic. I love you lots.